Welcome to Planetary Gig Talk, Tales of Music and Magic. I'm your host, Jefferson Glassy, Chief Spiritual Dude of the Planetary Gig Society, whose mission is creating unity through music, but as I like to say, making connections through music with the intention of bringing peace. And today I am in Studio One, the worldwide headquarters of the Planetary Gig Society, and our guest is in New York via Zoom. I'm really, really very pleased and appreciative uh, to be able to talk today with Dave Welsh. Dave, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Glad, happy to be here. Well, uh, I really appreciate the time. Um, I met you at uh, Wooten Woods um, mm-hmm. briefly for Music and Nature Camp when we went down in July because you only st- could stay a day or something. Uh, but then spent uh, in September theory camp and and uh, mu- music, spirit of music spirit, camp, spirit, yeah, right. Yeah. And but and, that's that's one of my favorite camps too. Oh my you goodness! Know, of all, of all the camps that we do, uh, and I love them all. And and of course, this is our twentieth year, and I've been involved since the very beginning. Uh, but when we started doing the spirit of music camp, something special happened. And it's it's always a an enlightening and inspiring couple of days. And it's great, and I'm glad you were able to get there. And I, and I know you really enjoyed it, and it had a, a profound effect on you. Oh my goodness, yeah! Uh, being able to interview uh, Bob Heminger and and Michael out on on the in the pavilion under the stars with the crickets was just <laughs> pretty amazing. But you know, plus everything else that goes on there. Sure. And, uh, and sure. I'm sure we're going to get into more of the you know your your work with Vic uh, and and that but I mm-hmm. I want to ask first so when do you remember music coming into your life I mean were your parents musical did they play music around the house did you get bit by the piano or something early on when you were young or did it come later I mean how did you how how did music tap its finger on you and and uh when was that Sure. I can't remember a time when there wasn't music in my life. I really can't remember. Um, my dad, well, there was always music playing in our house. It was always on our house, and it was mostly jazz. They're playing uh, on the record <clears throat> record player? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, on the record player. Because there was you know, very little jazz radio, although there was uh, often easy listening music on. And, you know, that... that dentist office stuff, you know, music of your your life, which sometimes we call music of your death. Um, (laughs) But I grew up around George Shearing and Miles Davis and Jerry Mulligan music on all the time, in addition to Henry Mancini, Montavani, Percy Faith, all all of those, uh, you know, beautiful music orchestras. But my dad was a trumpet player. And... um, not as a well as a profession, but a kind of a weekend warrior. Uh, he had a, a regular full time job. He started out as a machinist, and then by the time he retired, he was president of a, a special machinery company. Uh, but he always played music, and every Saturday night, you know, he was he was warming up before he went to a gig. He was a great trumpet player. In fact, uh, it was his trumpet, his B flat trumpet, that I played on this tour that we just did. Right. Uh, that was that was really fun for me to play yeah and we'll talk more about that later yeah. uh, about the power of music because i'm not known as a trumpet player um but victor seems to think i am <laughs> <So>. <laughs> i always end up playing trumpet on, on tour with him um but so music was always around my house my mother played piano just you know as a hobby my middle brother the, i'm the youngest of three brothers middle brother played piano and he had taken lessons my older brother played a little bit of upright bass, not a lot, but a little bit. And uh, in fact, that upright bass is, is the upright bass that I own now. Hmm. Uh, so it was always around our house. And we were always very involved uh, in music in, in the church and, and around. And really what happened for me to get into music performing, uh, my brother started a group that was associated with Up With People. You may remember Up With oh, People. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They do. were based in Tucson. Yeah, there were th- and there were three casts involved with up, up With People. And they would license their music 
to, uh, at, at that time, of course, the folk music thing was very big in the 60s, late 60s. And so my brother started a, a group in Scranton. I'm from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And uh, using Up With People, you know, licensed uh, Up With People music. And I started out actually singing in the chorus when like, I was like about... How, yeah. How old? Yeah, I was about eight years old. Eight, eight years old, okay. Yeah, when I started singing in the chorus. And then uh, <clears throat> my brother, actually, my oldest brother, Jack, was playing uh, upright bass. And uh, somewhere along the line, he stopped playing bass. I don't know, I, I don't remember what happened. But anyway, I started playing bass, as, as many of us do, on the bottom four strings of, a, of an acoustic guitar, mm. with a little contact mic that we had bought at Einan Drugstore, um, you know, that just slipped onto the sound hole of, of, the, of the acoustic guitar through this little tiny amplifier. And that's how I started playing bass. Wow. So my, my first performance in front of people uh, was when I was nine years old. And uh, then, you know, I, I played with that group for a number of years, and we, we, we did a lot of, of uh, performing around northeastern Pennsylvania. We did a couple of television shows and whatnot. But then when I was about 14 or 15, I started playing in clubs with my dad. Wow. Had you taken, had you, had, had you taken lessons or anything before, like before you were eight or... Or I had. I had taken some guitar lessons. And <laughs> the reason was there was a cartoon show called The Hardy Boys. Oh, yeah. And it was a takeoff, you know, it was takeoff on Franklin W. Dixon's Hardy Boys. But, it was, you know, it was a cartoon, and they, they had a band. And I thought playing that guitar was cool. Mm. So I was about seven or eight, I started taking guitar lessons. Well, I was having problems playing chords and, and getting my fingers into chord shapes. I can relate to that. Fast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just had a hard time with that. And so the, the guy I was taking lessons with was a, a friend of my dad's and ended up actually being my junior high band director. Um, he said, you know what, me, it, you might like playing bass. And so I started playing bass. And then for a while I went back and forth. I was doing a one week lesson on guitar and then one week lesson on bass. And then I just went to bass entirely. So I had had some lessons, but mainly, you know, I was, I was doing this by ear. Hmm. And all the practicing that I was doing in those days um, was playing along with records. And, of course, I say records, you know, and, and I just showed my age. But um, I, I played along with records all the time and listened. And to this day, I think it's become one of the most important skills that I have is being yeah. able to listen to something and, and learn it quickly. Yeah, that's for sure. It's hard to do, I know. It is. It is. But, and, but I find the more you do it, the better you get at it. Yeah. Um, and so I remember one, my brother loves to tell the story of one, one concert we were doing, the guitar player wasn't there for whatever reason. And there was an important hook that that particular guy was supposed to play in this song. And it was a really important thing. And it came to it and my brother heard it and he didn't know where it came from. And we just kept going and I played it and, and it wasn't my job to play it, but I knew it. So I played it and, you know, kind of saved the show cool. kind of a thing. But that's always been a, a, an important thing for me is listening. So that's where it started. Yeah, and so then uh, you started with, playing with your dad, gigs. Yeah, I played some, some gigs, you know, subbing with him and, or going on gigs and sitting in, you know. Um, and then I started to get known around the area. You know, the, the music community is very small. And even though Scranton, you know, is a fairly sizable city, or at least it was back then, you know, the music community is very tight. And... Uh, you know, I got to know a lot of people. I started getting called to sub. I got called for rehearsal bands. And I just, you know, started working. My band director in high school uh, was a really, really important force uh, in my musical life, Pat Marcinko. And uh, he, he really had a great influence. And I, and I played with him quite a bit. His son ended up actually being a drummer, uh, one of the drummers with Maynard Ferguson Band in the uh, 90s. And uh, now travels with Dave Liebman, mm. uh, with another friend of mine, Tony Marino. But anyway, uh, Pat had a real, a real powerful influence uh, on getting me going in music. And probably one of the biggest things that got me interested in, in jazz and big band music was when my father took me to see Maynard Ferguson in 1973. Mm. And that had a profound effect on me. And uh, the rest, as they say, is just gigs and gigs and gigs and... So, you know, playing in front of people. So you decided pretty young, I mean, teens, I guess, that music is what you wanted to do. 
Yeah, and you know, and I've done other things along the way. I worked in radio for a number of years. Uh, I worked in Radio Shack, you know, for a couple of years right when I was out of college. Uh, but yeah, music has has always been there. It's always something that I've, I've enjoyed doing. And I always say, you know, the, the day I stop loving it, I'll stop doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's really not about the money, you know. Um, and, and of course, being a, a musician, you've got to do a lot of different things. You can't just be a bass player. Yeah. You can't just be a drummer. You have to do a lot of different things. So, uh, but it's all, you know, everything I do is, is really related to music or sound somehow. So you decided like that it was your profession to do full time in mid twenties mm-hmm. or something like that, or, and you started teaching yeah, and yeah, gigging I, and yeah, I, 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 you know, I was, I was teaching and gigging all the way through. I started teaching in 1979, um, private lessons for mostly guitar players. Uh, but there, uh, through a turn of events in 1992, I became a stay at home dad for my oldest daughter hmm. and my, my working for other people, professional life just kind of came to an end and that was okay, you know, because I, I was playing a lot and, uh, teaching more and more here in my studio. And, and of course now teaching on with Skype is, is great. I've, you know, students all over the world, which is wonderful. Uh, but yeah, so I guess it was sometime in my in my uh, mid twenties, maybe early thirties, that uh, it became a, a full time thing. Definitely. And, and then I don't know if this is leaping ahead, but um, when did you uh, meet Vic and start? Uh, sure. Doing all that. Sure. We I we met I think in nineteen ninety four. We have a, an arts and, and music festival here in the, the town that I live in called Harbor Fest, and the Flectones were playing there, and mm-hmm. they were a trio at that point. They had just become a trio. Howard had just left the band, and uh, it was a little outdoor concert, and uh, we ended up chat. Of course, the Flectones always sit on the stage after the show, and I ended up talking with Vic, and through conversation, actually left there with a phone number. Uh, at that time, he and Holly were living in New York. New York City. Mm-hmm. And so anytime the Flectones would come anywhere near upstate New York, I would travel to wherever they were and sit on the bus and have a quote unquote lesson and then take him out to dinner and then, you know, be at the show. And we, and we became friends over the years. And so that, that was in 94, right about 97. If you can imagine this, nobody had, or very few people had vanity websites. You know, artists didn't have a lot of websites in those days. Mm-hmm. The internet, of course, it was it's pretty new. Now. Yeah, yeah, it is relatively sure. And so we were having dinner one night. I'll tell you, we were in Oneonta, New York, and having dinner. I was sitting having dinner with the Flectones, and at that time, Jeff Coffin was still a guest with the Flectones. He wasn't a member of the organization. And he said, just in passing, he said, "Well, you know, I'm thinking one of these days I should probably have a website." And I had mentioned earlier that day that I'd like to do something for Vic, for his career. And so immediately I thought, geez, maybe that's something I could do. Because I had done some coding and and had done my own website. Hmm. uh, But learned how to do so with a magazine that I bought in a grocery store. (laughs) Of course, in those days, there was no no WordPress, no front page, no Dreamweaver. It was all typing code by hand. Yeah. And so I had an idea that, that maybe, you know, doing that for Victor might be a good idea. And so I went, came home, did a website. He saw it about six months later at a gig in Ithaca, New York, and uh, loved it. And we launched VictorWooten.com. And so that's how I really started wow. working in the organization. Yeah, we launched in 1998. And since then, it's just been adding titles and jobs and things i've been his tour manager i've been a personal assistant i've been his uh, his manager's assistant i've you know i just do whatever you know anything from business to taking his kids to soccer games <laughs> yeah well at, at camp it's clear that you know you really uh, kind of make a lot of those things run uh, let me ask a question sure what, what was it from your perspective about bela fleck and the fleck tones i mean what was you, I didn't really know them at the time, but you you mm-hmm. you go way back with them. You know, it's interesting. Of course, the, the time that I met Victor here is the first time I'd ever heard him play live. And at that time, I only had one record, and it was actually at the radio station. I was still, uh, when I first heard it, I was still working in radio. Um, 
I don't know. I don't know. There was something about the instrumentation, something about the music that just hit me viscerally, you know, and I, I really, it's one of those things about music where you really can't explain it. Right. You just know when it hits you. Yeah. You know, you just know. And I just loved the sound. And of course, I loved the, the sound of, of what Vic was doing and didn't understand at all what he was doing. Couldn't figure it out at all. Uh, I, I just likened it to some kind of a flamenco mm -hmm. uh, picking thing, which, it, it, you know, in some ways it's similar. Um, but it, it was just something about the combination of those instruments that I just really, really enjoyed. And, you know, it just, it just went from there. And so then was one of the next things when he started camps and you got in, you, you know, you were working with him yeah. and the websites and some of that stuff, but yeah, and different things. Yeah. Well, he had this crazy idea for this camp, mixing uh, music and nature. And, and all of us who are involved have, all have stories of him talking about it and all thinking he was crazy. Um, but it's Vic. Vic is an idea person. He has, he's Amazing, just flooded yes. with ideas all the time. He's always thinking of stuff. And he he's, has a, a, a circle of people around him that make it happen. If it does, you know, and so he had this idea and I remember, uh, first day he talked about it. Um, uh, I can't even remember where we were. We were in Saratoga Springs, New York, and I was out there, you know, visiting him and the Flectones. And, oh no, I'm sorry. It wasn't the Flectones. It was the yin yang tour. Hmm. Um, yeah, it was the yin yang tour. So anyway, he had this idea and I said, well, you know, I want to be involved. Anthony Wellington and I were having breakfast with him and we said, yeah, yeah, we want to be involved somehow. So it, it, you know, we built a, an ad. I built an ad for Downbeat Magazine, and which is really the only advertising we've ever done for the camp. Mm -hmm. uh, it ran that year, and then we had some left over, so we ran it the next year. But everything else has been word of mouth. And actually, that very first year, Anthony and I drove the shuttles from the airport. And ah. we're kind of a gopher. Yeah, a gophers. And that was and too a... That was, that was too a... He just had the camp at a like a public... Uh, yeah, it was at Montgomery or? Bell State Park. Yeah, Montgomery Bell State Park, uh, which is uh, about 40 miles or so west of Nashville in Dixon, Tennessee. Um, and we were there for uh, nine years at that camp. And it was difficult because we would have to build a day on either end of the camp because we had to load in for a day and then load out. Uh -huh. And at that time, we were renting amplifiers or, or, or having amplifiers loaned to us. Uh, from the company that Vic was with at that time, uh, uh, the endorsement. And so we had to look, you know, get a truck and load in all the equipment and then take the truck back. And, and you know, and that first year, Anthony and I, I think we made 36 trips to the airport to wow. pick up people. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was great. And, it, and, you know, we had no idea what we were doing. In between every class, we'd sit out by a picnic table and say, okay, what do we do next? Um, and it clicked and a lot of friendships have, have come right from there. Uh, you know, Steve Bailey, uh, Richard Cleveland, these, you know, these are the original, original instructors and we're all still together, um, 20 years later. It's very so cool. So it was, it, yeah, it was very, something very, very special. And it's one of those things, again, it's like listening to that music. You can't explain it. You know, and the first day we met. All of these people came together from all over the country. The first day we met, it was like we knew each other forever. Mm -hmm. And so it, was what just, it just clicked. It just worked right from the beginning. What, what do you and think? There's never, been, there's never been a bad word yeah. between us, ever. Um, so. do you, what are your thoughts on what Vic was trying to accomplish, or is he just you know, wanted to do a camp? And then what kind of what has turned out from that camp and turn and you know when you look back at it and yeah. now that you're yeah. doing 20 years um it's a pretty special thing it really it really is and it, it's it's always fascinating to me to watch the change in the student or the camper whatever whatever we call them uh, we call them woodies once they've graduated um to watch the change over the course of the week you know obviously when when people come they're often awestruck by Victor, you know, and I mean, here's a guy who's arguably one of the most important people in the bass guitar, in the history of the bass guitar, which is a very young instrument. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so there's a lot of that. But then what they find out um, after a, a short amount of time is, this is a normal guy. You know, and, and I think we've really been somehow successful in making the connection between music and life. So that where a lot of these students come wanting to learn, you know, double thumping and open hammer pluck and, and tapping and all this stuff, but they end up leaving with some kind of a, a, a personal growth thing. You know, they, they become better people. You know, and I've always said, I heard, it, I heard it said many, many years ago, and I've repeated it, if you want to be a better musician, just be a better person. Mm. You know, there, there's no difference. You know, it's what came first. You know, and it's always been interesting to me that some of the finest, most amazing musicians that I've met are just wonderful people. And I, that can't be a coincidence. That can't be a coincidence. And I think that comes out, you know, comes through their music. Um, so that, I think, has been the, the most interesting thing about the whole experience in that, you know, people have had these, and we've heard hundreds of people have had these life-changing, what they call life-changing experiences. In fact, one of our staff um, has had that, had that experience the very, very first camp, and it ended up changing his life entirely. And 20 years later, he still can't talk about it. He, he gets choked up when he talks about mm. it. Uh, so it was something very, very profound. Uh, so, you know, it can be that. And I don't want to say that it's always going to be that. I don't want to give anybody the expectation that, you know, you come to Wooten Woods and you're going to leave a changed person. And, and you know, we definitely don't want to have a drink the Kool-Aid type of thing. Um, but it can have a powerful experience if you're open to it. Well, you know, the, the music lesson book to me was just, you know, kind of this quirky little novel with some mm -hmm. char some characters, but there was just so much to uncover about music that wasn't just, you know, playing chords mm -hmm. or whatever. Right. And, right. and that, right. that really is profound. So, um, I've heard that the campers, uh, like to hear Vic talk about the, you know, the 10 elements of music and. Mm -hmm. And that sort of thing, and then that then they wanted him to do a book, and and he talked right. about, you know, seeing uh, another book that I liked as a kid, uh, Illusions: The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah, and he mm -hmm. was like, oh, I'll write a, a novel. But do you remember right. sort of the the formative stages of the music lesson? And oh, very much so. And and how did that? What is the very the effect much. that you've seen of the music lesson, and and uh, what what's come from that? Well, it, it's really been something to see that used as a textbook in, in music departments at colleges and some high schools. Um, and, and, you know, as, as, you, as you mentioned, he knew that people wanted him to write a book. He knew that people wanted him to write, you know, a method book. And he didn't want to do that because, you know, if, if somebody writes a method book, the inclination is that that's the method and that's it. And you have to believe it. And so his impetus for writing a, a novel was, believe it if you want, <laughs> you yeah. know, it's a novel, you know, but it's, it's very, very much rooted in the, you know, his philosophy of music. And it's very much the, the philosophy of the camp of, of music. And it's the way we, you know, it's the way we teach it. It's like a language, you know, uh -huh. there, there, there's that word. Music is a language. And so obviously I think it, it can be used as communication just as spoken language can be. But yeah, I do remember the very early days of the book. In fact, I'll confess that that's one of the, the last times I read the book was when it was still a galley, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I have here. But, and I need to go back and read it again, especially now with the, the second uh, edition or, or the, new, the new book coming out this year. Um, but, you know, he would, he would write a chapter and send it to us. He'd send it to Steve and myself. And, you know, he'd say, what do you think? And, um, you know, it was, it was really, really something to watch it, to watch it, 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 uh, become a, th you know, to watch it come to fruition. And, and, uh, when we first did it, it was self-published. We started uh -huh. a company called yep. Fix Books and a friend of ours designed the cover and we actually self-published it. And I'll, I remember one of my jobs at that time was to call around to newspapers around the country and to get re book reviews. And one, one uh, company that I called, a very famous newspaper, which I won't mention, uh, basically the, the book editor or book reviewer hung up on me. 
She said, oh, you know, who's the publisher of the book? I said, well, right now it's self-published. And she stopped me. She said, there has never been, nor will there ever be, a self-published book worth reading. And she hung up. And uh, that was really shocking to me. Yeah. And, of course, it was shortly after that that Penguin got a hold of it. And, you know, it's blown up. It's in a bunch of different languages now. It's an audio book. Oh, I love uh, the audio book. I've listened to that so many times. They did such a great job with that. It, it really, you know, it, it, the audio book is amazing in that all the characters in the book, the, the characters that those are based on, actually do the voices uh, in the book. And, uh, you know, it's mixed in full stereo with a soundtrack and, and the whole deal. And it was all done by Vic right in his studio. It's amazing. Yeah, it really is, really is something. What, what, from your perspective, was sort of the message that people got or that you, you got out of the music lesson that kind of makes it so, I don't know, meaningful? Well, you know, I, I think part of it is, is to think of music not, no, not only as a person but as a living entity, you know, it, it always seems to me, and, and I, I think about practicing when I, and uh, students going to practice. I always say, you know, have a have a bass or or your instrument out in your room because if you have to go to your closet to get out your instrument, you won't do it. Mm -hmm. And so, music is often, I think, shown to be something that's over there. You know, it's yeah. something that I'm trying to attain. You know, one day I'm going to learn how to play the guitar. Well, the guitar is a living thing. It's a vibrating, living piece of wood. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you, you treat it like that. It's, it's not something that you, you attain. It's something that you absorb, you know, if, if that's making sense. Yeah. And I think that's been the biggest thing about the music lesson is to look at music as a living entity. At least it has been for me. Not just as some form of entertainment, uh, which, which is great. Which it is. And, and you know, it, I've always been a little bit uh, jealous of people who can listen to music just for pure enjoyment. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the curses of being a musician is it's hard to do that. You I can do it every once in a while, but it's hard to do. You want to participate. Well, you do. And, and I'm always afraid that I'm going to miss something. You know, for many, many years, I couldn't listen to the Miles Davis album, Kind of Blue, without really just sitting and, and intently listening to it because it's such an important album. I was afraid I was going to miss something, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's so, it's hard. Um, I mean, we'll put on dinner music while, while we're having dinner and, I, and I'm listening to the music, you know, yeah, I'm enjoying the dinner, <laughs> but I'm listening to chord changes. <laughs> you know? And so it, it, it's difficult to do, but I think it, it's thinking of music as a living entity that, communicates that is emotional that that uh, has an effect on you just as as any other living thing does that that, so we're, that, that we're part of yeah that yeah. we're part I of think that that's we been are. my takeaway yeah right that's been my takeaway from the book i think so there's a there's you know the the phrase power of music is one i mean i use a lot and people use mm -hmm. it a lot and mm -hmm. you've obviously been dealing living music your whole life and and this mm -hmm. you know you're you're sort of gig with Victor over these years has been very mm -hmm. special. How would you talk about the power of music? And maybe the only way to talk about it is things that you've seen or, or I mean, I'm sure you've seen so with so, so many of the, the campers and the performances and all, but just how do you, do you, how do you describe what that is? Well, and, you know, I mean, who am I to say what it is? I can, I can just say what I've, what I've seen. Like you, like you said, um, it's amazing to me always to watch people enjoy music. And they can enjoy it, and that's why I'm jealous of them sometimes, they can enjoy it without really even knowing what it is. And, you know, I've played a million weddings in my career, and man, there are some horrible dancers. <laughs> <laughs> just, just horrible. But the music affects them in some way that, they don't care. Yeah, you know they're just enjoying the music. Um, you know, I'm I'm always wondering. You know, of course, I see it at Flectone shows all the time. But you see hippie dance. You know, what we call the hippie dance, and I have to wonder what they're hearing because I'm not hearing the rhythms that they're dancing <laughs> to. But 
they're having a great time, and yeah. the music is moving them in that way. Um, so that's always exciting to me, and I love to, to make people and watch people smile. One of my goals in life is to make people smile, you know, and that's Good why goal. I kind of act cool sometimes. You know, and, and, you know, you saw it at the, at the show uh, where we were in Austin, Austin last week. You know, I just love to connect with the audience and pick somebody in the audience and make them smile. You know, pick somebody else and make them smile. You know, it's a goal of mine. If I go to a store and somebody's really grumpy behind the counter, well, I'm not leaving that store to, like, get a smile out of them. You that's know, a, that's, that's a really crack. good goal, Dave. No, I, I like it. It's, it's just something I enjoy. I enjoy doing so I, I love seeing that in people. I love seeing people smile. It's like it's impossible to listen to Dixieland jazz without smiling in my book. Mm -hmm. it just, you know, I love to watch people laugh. But it's always interesting to me, and, and, and Victor always makes comment about this, uh, or often makes a comment about this at the end of the show. You go to a concert for two hours or whatever, and you sit there with people you don't know, you ultimately don't care what color they are. You don't, call, you don't care what kind of a religion they practice, if they even practice a religion. Um, you don't care about their economic status. You don't care about what they're wearing. You're just at a concert enjoying being with people and enjoying the music. Well, if we can do it in a two-hour concert, we have to be able to do it in the world. You yeah. have to. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so you have to wonder, well, what's... what's holding us up what makes it not work like that and uh, obviously there are a lot of, of factors political factors and and personal gain and financial all, all that. and religious and yeah. all this. Yeah, yeah. exactly exactly you know it's, it's like thanksgiving dinner you know never talk about religion or politics you know it's always going to be a problem um but music seems to be something we can all agree on you know i mean even if it's music i don't particularly like you know, and there are styles of music I don't particularly like, but I still appreciate their power to, you know, affect people in, in some kind of a way. Um, so that, that is one of the things that, that I really enjoy about music. I love watching an, an audience. You know, playing in a sound check is horrible. You know, it's dull. But boy, as soon as you hit and, and the audience is there, man, it's instant energy. You know, there's a synergy that, that just... You know, these synapses that go back and yeah. forth between the audience and, and the band. And it's just, man, it's, it's electric. It's yeah, electric. Real, yeah, real connection. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is. Um, yeah. You know, you just, uh, not to go off a tangent, but you mentioned uh, when you were talking about playing the horns and, mm -hmm. and you'd get back to that as, you know, talking about the power of music. Mm -hmm. what, was, what were you referring to there? Well, the thing I, the thing about that I think is is you know people always seem to be uh, it's kind of a technical thing, but people seem to be amazed at multi instrumentalists. Mm -hmm. And the thing about music and multi the only difference between instruments is mechanics of playing the instrument. The language is all the same. And so once you know or have an understanding of the language of music, it doesn't matter what instrument you're playing. Once you've you know, once you've challenged or once you've accomplished uh, or, or, or uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, you've gotten the mechanics down. Uh -huh. You know, you've learned how to play the instrument. I started playing trumpet when I was in junior high school. And I played all through school, even though I've always been a bass player, uh, all through high school and even in college, I played brass instruments. Played tuba, euphonium. Actually, I was, I was a euphonium major. Whoa. When I was in, in, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's something. But always a bass player, but still always a bass player. Mm -hmm. And I wish that I had studied bass more when I was in college. Uh, I am not classically trained, although I play upright bass. But I am not classically trained. I came to the upright bass from electric. Um, but I guess what I'm getting at is that, that music is so universal that you know I can you can, you can talk about it or I can talk about it through a number of different instruments, and it's still music. Yeah. You know, so, so. Um, w one of the things that you really feel uh, when you go to a camp is mm -hmm. the the community that kind of is there and that comes out of that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the community from the Spirit of Music camp has been, for me, I, I've just been the one time, 
really mm-hmm. strong, some real great mm-hmm. connections, some things that we're interesting in. You know, it's a, Michael talked about the Nada Brahma book and in the interview with him, and a bunch of us said, wow, that's cool. And we've yeah. started a yeah. Zoom video book group talking about the pr- principles of Nada Brahma, which is really so, so uh-huh. deep and all that. And you were also just talking about, you know, if we can have this level of amazing connection and and unity in two hours, why can't we do it? You know, exactly. otherwise, mm-hmm. um, thoughts about you know the expand, you know the com- the music community. Is it possible to expand that community or bring others in to you know? Is, should we be well, trying to do that, or does it make sense? What do you think? It well. I don't know that music is the answer, the only answer. It's definitely a tool. Um, not everybody can play music. You know, let's face it, not everybody can be a drummer. You know, not everybody can be a guitar player. Um, but you'd be amazed. A lot of people can. In fact, one of the things we've done, Victor's been doing for a number of years, and we did it a couple times on this tour, was bring somebody up out of the audience that doesn't play an instrument. And we put a bass on them, and they're playing a groove in a couple of minutes, <laughs> you know, which again, that's pretty interesting because there's the power of music. Yeah. You know, and it, so that, that's always cool. That's always interesting. So I, I'm not sure that music is the only tool. In fact, I know it isn't the only right. tool that we can use, but it's a valuable tool. But I think the biggest thing is a, that, like you said, that feeling of community where you, you feel empathy and compassion and love for the people around you. You know, I think compassion is one of the biggest, one of the biggest things. Uh, I'm a, a, I like to read Pema Chodron quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jeff Coffin turned me on to her a number of years ago when I was having some, some going through some personal issues. And he said, boy, you got to read Pema. Um, and so I did. And her, you know, one of her biggest things is, is compassion. You know, and of course the Dalai Lama, uh, the same thing. And so that's it's feeling compassion for the people around you, and for yourself. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. And so if if music can help with that, I think that's that's you know definitely something that that's a positive thing. Um, I, I don't see sports doing that. You no, know, there's a great great sports community, but it's competitive. Yeah. You know, and it's one of the things, one of my pet peeves is music competitions. I don't like music competitions because I don't feel you can put objective criteria on something that is subjective. Um, you know, I, I can't say, one of the hardest things I ever did, I was an adjudicator for a jazz festival once. It was horrible. You know, it was horrible. How can I say this band is better than this band? <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not going to take points off of this band because they had a conga player playing on a Count Basie tune. You know, I, I can't. I can't do that, you know. So, I forget what we were talking about. Oh, we were talking about uh, music healing the world. Uh, it's a tool. It's a tool. And I, but I think it ultimately has to come down to the human condition, to compassion and empathy. Yeah, you know, it's, for your fellow man. it certainly is. It seems to me it's a really good tool because it's one that everybody kind of gets, understands. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. I've, I've said before, I think I could probably interview everybody on the planet. I don't know if I have, if I have enough time to do that. But <laughs> everyone would have a story about music. I mean, I'm convinced, sure. you know, in their little sure. village or wherever they are. Um, sure. You know, there's... Well, and music has been used you know, for... You talk about villages. It's It's been used for communication, you know, forever. And You know, where, whether it was drumming, you know, um, it's been used. And... It means something, <laughs> you know, and I, as, as you know, when I teach theory, I do this whole big thing about music as a language, and I mean that to the nth degree, and, you know, right from a letter to a novel, you know, that you can follow all the rules of, of speech or all the rules of spoken language, exactly the same in music. And, you know, as far as learning music, the more you think, I think, of music that way, the more you think of music as a language, fully as a language, like a spoken language, the better you're going to learn it and develop fluency in it. Um, but it, I think it, it's one tool, yeah, I think that's universal. I think everybody can be affected by it. Um, and I hope, hopefully, in a good way. 
hopefully in a good way. Yeah, it seems to me that that's right. So, you know, I'm sure that, that we could continue talking for a long time about, you know, oh, hours. Ex- examples <laughs> of, you know, pe- people you've seen and effects of mm-hmm. music on them at camp and and whatever. Mm-hmm. But I just wonder if you have other, uh, something I haven't asked about or any other thoughts about kind of what you're doing, where you're going, 20 years with the camp. I mean, it's just a fabulous thing that that you all are putting on. I so appreciate it. Um where 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 are we headed? What are, what's what's next? Well, we you know, like I said, Vic is an idea person, and he's just filled with ideas. Um, one of them just came to fruition, which was with the Wooten Woods Experience tour. He's been talking about that for about five years now, huh, huh. and uh, he'd love to do it again. Of course, we did the Midwest on this run. He'd like to do the West Coast. He'd like to do the East Coast. When it's going to happen, or if it's going to happen, who knows? Right. You know, it was incredibly expensive tour and we have to really thank our sponsors uh samson and hartke um and federa who helped out with the tour and and of Mm -hmm. course i'm probably forgetting some um to make that happen because tour buses aren't cheap we had to have two tour buses right um and the crew and you know the whole deal but so anyway that came to fruition that's something that he's been talking about for a long time one of the things that's on the horizon i think and who knows when this will happen would be doing a camp type situation, uh, traveling, doing it on the road. Mm. Part of that started to happen with this trip, although our schedule was so tight that we didn't have a lot of time to spend, you know, doing clinics or master classes. He did do a couple. Um, the other thing is that he's talking about, and we've been talking about for some time, is to do these camps internationally. We have ties now through through uh, Steve Bailey being in, uh, tied with Berkeley, mm-hmm. uh, being the chairman of the base department, with the the Berkeley uh, College in Europe, uh, in Spain. So we're talking about doing something there. We have a friend uh, who runs a music camp similar to ours in Singapore. We've talked about going there and doing a camp. Uh, so to take that globally, I think, would be would be a really cool thing to do. Uh, but who knows? You know, who knows? I know we have uh, our regular camps this year, plus we've added one called Teaching About Teaching. Uh-huh. We've all often thought that it would be a good idea for music educators to see some of what we're doing, uh, the way we approach teaching music. Uh, I personally feel that we often teach music the wrong way or, or an ineffective way, an inefficient way, which is to talk about all the rules and then go and try to make music. And that's not the way we learn to talk. We learn to talk by imitating our parents and, you know, saying what we heard. Yep. Well, if music is a language, why can't we learn that the same way? You know, but we tend to teach it where, you know, you have to learn scales and chords and all this theory and then go sit in a practice room. That doesn't make really good musicians. You know, it makes good performers, but not sometimes, but not really good musicians. So that's something that that's, you know... I think is going to be interesting this year is is uh, teaching about teaching. Yeah, so a lot of a yeah, lot of good things on the a lot of good things on the horizon. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, well, absolutely. We'll we'll really be looking forward to to these things. I am very happy to be part of the tribe, one of the on one of the team, whatever the whatever it is, mm-hmm. and yeah, uh, we're just happy to have you in, involved with uh, what's going on because it's just it's some beautiful stuff. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. All right, so Dave Welsh, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me today, and I really look forward to seeing you again soon sometime. Yeah, thanks so much, Jeff. It's been a real pleasure, and uh, I wish you all the best of luck with this, this organization. It really sounds great. Yeah. It sounds great. Thanks, Dave. You've been listening to Planetary Gig Talk. Tales of Music and Magic. I'm your host, Jefferson Glassy, Chief Spiritual Dude of the Planetary Gig Society. We talk with musicians and others about the power of music and how we can use music to help create a better world. Please check out our website, www.planetarygigs.org, for information about some of the organizations promoting music and musicians. Resources about the power of music, books, movies, articles, including new research on music and the brain. We welcome your support. 
Planetary Gig Society is a Section 501c3 charitable organization, and you can donate on the website. You also can receive a free email signature block demonstrating your support for Planetary Gig Society. Please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Planetary Gigs. And we want to thank fabulous musician and teacher Eric Weinberg of Little Eric Studios for the Planetary Gig Talk music titled Chill Kid, It's Saul. So please check out Planetary Gig Talk on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Subscribe and hear all the upcoming episodes. Thanks very much.